would rabbis go so far as to even change the text in order to mask that this is talking about Jesus? Judaism in the time of the Bible is not Judaism of today. They have nothing to do, almost nothing to do with one another. James. What? You see this? Yes. I got that in Texas. Oh, good. That's why it's so big. Welcome, I'm here today with a good friend of mine, Eaton Barr. I met Eaton in 2017. He is actually the one who interviewed me and produced the video that was put on the One for Israel website where I talked about how I came to know the Lord. The way he gave his life. I believe it now. Well, welcome, Eaton. Hi, shalom, it's good to be here. <laughs> Let me just give a little bit of background on Eaton. He's a, he's a Jewish believer in Jesus and he was born in Tel Aviv, and he has a bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degree in Bible and theology, and he has a lot of production background as well. He, before he, he really studied uh, uh, Bible, he, he worked in, in marketing, and uh, uh, he gives lectures, and he's a prolific writer, especially uh, this year. You have several new books coming out this year. The one we're going to talk about today is this one, Refuting Rabbinic Objections to Christianity. You've been in Christian ministry for many years and very active in Christian ministry and done lots of videos and lots of lectures uh, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, evangelism and particularly uh, with, with, a, with a heart to reach the Jewish people because you are Jewish, I am Jewish, and we are both believers in Jesus. Now, before I begin... I'd like to ask everybody that who comes on my podcast, mm. can you tell us in just a minute or two why you, as such an educated man, would believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ? So why would I, as a Jew, believe in the resurrection? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, of course, you have all the classic apologetics, um, but, but from a Jewish perspective, first of all, it's a good question. Um, you know, in the in the Talmud, um, they talk a lot about Olam Haba, which means the next world. Um, why as Jews are we, I wouldn't say obsessed, but hoping for, for another world? What is the problem with this one? What, what's the problem with this world? And the problem is that we die. And death means game over. Now, what is Olam Haba, if not... Resurrection. Resurrection is the answer for anyone who will die, and I'm one of them. So if I lived in the time of, let's say, Second Temple Judaism, I would likely associate the Messiah with my resurrection. I would probably expect the Messiah to have something to do with my resurrection. And if I had something to do Sorry, if, if, if Yeshua, if the Messiah, had something to do with my resurrection, I would obviously also expect him to be resurrected as well. So what did Yeshua do? He killed death. So if Christ conquered death, then nothing can kill Christ. And those who are in Christ will also be resurrected to life and will never die again. Is that a Jewish enough Ansel? That's Jewish enough answer. Thank you. Uh, you. You speak about Judaism. What is Judaism? People don't often realize that Judaism in the time of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, is not Judaism of today. That is completely, it's two different animals. They have nothing to do, almost nothing to do with one another. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm trying to picture King David dressed like a Hasidic Jew, and it just it doesn't it doesn't work. Um, so it's two different things with the same name. Um, yeah, so it, it's important to realize that first. Um, you know, it began the new Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, began with a conflict. Um, and, and, and the conflict um, was actually between the Pharisees and the believ believers in Jesus. 
and um, that conflict especially escalated um, when Rabbi Akiva um, announced one Jewish guy named Bar Kochva um, to be the Messiah uh, during the revolt against the Romans, the Roman Empire, and the the Messianic Jews or the Jewish believers in Jesus, um, they first joined the revolt, but when Rabbi Akiva announced um, Bar Kochva to be the Messiah, they said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We, he's not the Messiah. We cannot join you in the revolt. And I think that was probably the point in history. That was around 135, okay? So, like 100 years after Jesus died. And probably the point where they splitted, because up until that point, you had... Jewish believers in Jesus praying together in the same synagogues with other Jews, you know, and then they split it. So just some background. Yes. Um, yeah, key messianic prophecies, um, you know, of course you have Isaiah 53, which is the, you know, the grand um, prophecy of the Messiah suffering for, uh, because, because of our sins, for our sins, and dying for us, uh, you have Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, uh, Psalm 22 also is much like um, Isaiah 53, uh, Zechariah 12, um, a lot of those available online, of course, in my book as well, but you know, my favorite one is actually Zechariah 9, 9, which many people don't even uh, aware of it, and it's my favorite because it describes a king who rides a donkey. Now, look at leaders around us today. They ride tanks, airplanes, luxury cars. They hide behind bodyguards in their gated and protected communities. Um, now, look at Yeshua. Yeshua, he didn't even ride a horse, just a donkey. A donkey is very slow. You cannot run away from anything, um, but that's okay because he came to be with us. You know, he, he doesn't have any bodyguards, any bodyguards to protect him. Instead, he came to give his life for us. And it's kind of that spirit in the, in the prophecy, mm. you know, of a donkey, a donkey Messiah. Our Messiah is like a donkey, he's lowly, he's so lowly, he's so relatable. Who did he? hang out with the most? The kings? No. The emperors? No. The, the, the Pharisees? The, the religious people? No. No. With the outcasts of society. Mm. With the outcasts. So this is, that's why it's my favorite um, yeah. prophecy. Um, but you you know, you, we have to understand that Judaism have 2,000 years worth of their own apologetics and explanations about the, these prophecies. They, do, they are not necessarily unaware of them. Sure, the secular Jews probably are unaware, but the rabbis are very well aware of those prophecies, and they have a lot of apologetics um, and polemics. Um, ab about those prophecies, and so, so so you were commenting. Let me let me just see if I can direct this a little bit. You were commenting that rabbinic Judaism is very different from the Judaism that we see in the Old Testament, and it really is. I mean, it's it's just totally different. And and uh, but would would rabbis go so far as to even change the text in order to to mask that this is talking about Jesus as the Messiah? Would they even go so far as to do that? That's a sensitive issue, but they actually admit changing some texts. Um, in Hebrew, it's called tikkun sofrim, which means um, the corrections of the scribes. They admit changing 18 places in the Hebrew scriptures. 
Um, I will argue it's much more than that. Um, let me give you an example. I'll take a drink and you will read Hosea 14, 2. But I need you to read it from the Jewish Publication Society. Can you oh. do that? Uh, Online. I think I... Okay. I or I can, I, I have it. I can read it, and you read the. Yeah, you, 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 you need to read it because I, I, I didn't, I did, I had it. You had asked me to look that up. I didn't know that you were going to ask me to read it in the thing, and it's on the computer that I'm working off of, so I don't want to ruin the feed. Okay, so Hosea forty nine, Hosea uh, fourteen two, take with you words and return unto the Lord. Say unto him, forgive all iniquity and accept that which is good, so will we render for bullocks the offerings, the offering of our lips. The last part is the crucial part. I'll try again. So will we render for bullocks, cows, um, the offering of our lips. So the Orthodox rabbis point to this verse and um, to say that we don't need sacrifices because here God accepts prayers instead of sacrifices. Now you read the NIV. Okay. All right. So this is this is uh, uh, Hosea, right? Mm -hmm. And chapter two. Mm -hmm. Fourteen. Chapter fourteen. Fourteen verse. Verse, two? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, let me turn, put it on NIV. Okay, verse 2, Hosea 14, 2. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. So is it fruit or is it sacrifices? Is it... Cows or fruits? If you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, send me an email and give me a chance to tell you by Zoom why I believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it says, and we do render the fruit of our lips. So the literal translation is fruit. It's, we can argue about that. With, with Judaism. So the Jewish translations also in Hebrew would, would give you um, um, cows, basically. Mm -hmm. um, in Hebrew, it actually says cows. Um, but the Christian translations say um, fruit. Mm -hmm. That's a huge difference. That's a huge difference in the context, in the meaning. Um, so in Hebrew it says either it says pri mesfatenu or it says parim sfatenu. You have two words, the last letter, either you attach it to the second word or you end the first word with it and it completely changes the meaning. You know, they moved. By the way, I'm not saying that. Secular Jewish scholars say it. They moved the last letter. They shifted it from Mesfatenu to the first word. So it sounds. So so it says parim cows bullocks. Um, that's one example. We can see another example in Psalm twenty two sixteen. Um, I will do the Jewish. You know what? You do the NIV first. Okay. Psalm, Psalm 22, 16. 22, 16 in NIV. <clears throat> By the way, Dogs. James. What? You see this? Yes. I got that in Texas. Oh, good. That's why it's so good. big. That's why it's so big. That's right. Yeah. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. They did what to my hands and my feet? They pierce my hands they and pierce. my feet. Okay, now I will read from the Jewish Publication Society, the, the Jewish version. Okay. I'll, okay, I'll just jump 
um, for dogs have encompassed me, a company of evildoers have enclosed me like a lion, they are at my hands and my feet. So again, is it pierced or is it like a lion? Again, so the difference in Hebrew is karu kari, karu kari. And the difference is one letter that is just a line. And if it's a long line, it's e. Eh, sorry, it's u. If it's a short line, it's e. Kari, karu. And if you look, for example, at the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can see it's a longer one. But if you see, if you look at the Masoretic text, which every Jew have at home in Israel, in Hebrew, then you see um, it's the um, short the one. Shorter one. Yeah. But pe pe people don't get this. The Masoretic text is a text that predates the birth of Jesus. So prior to Jesus' coming... No, no, that's... Right? The no, no, that's... I'm the, sorry, I'm sorry, the Dead Sea Scrolls, pre, yeah. the Dead Sea Scrolls predates the birth of Jesus. So prior to Jesus' coming, the, the teaching clearly was piercing my hands and my feet. After Jesus comes, the Mesoretic text is now changed to be saying with, with that other letter that the, the, it's like lions. So the whole idea of the piercing of my hands and my feet, which we, of course, look at this, that this is exactly what was prophesied, that was changed after Jesus came so that there was no association with that any longer. Is, 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 am I getting this right? So the mo motivation, we can argue about the motivation. Some people would say it's a mistake that happened, that some scribe mistake that happened to be. I don't buy it. Um, but let's just leave it. Okay. And All right. So, 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 so that answered my question. But let, let me just say also, you know, this whole chapter of Isaiah 53, which actually starts at Isaiah 52, 13, all the way through Isaiah 53, which is this amazing portion. So if you're not familiar with this, you need to I re read this. Isaiah 52, 13, through Isaiah, all through the end of Isaiah 53. Now, I have sat with Orthodox Jewish friends... And, and uh, uh, they say that they've read that. I said, I, you know, I don't think you read it very often because it's not in the pattern that you read in the synagogues. And I sat in a room with an Orthodox friend and I said, you read it from the Hebrew Scriptures. I'm going to read it in my English Bible. Let's start reading this together. We got halfway through. He took his Bible and he closed it. He said, enough. When you read that chapter, it, it so speaks in my mind of Jesus. And interestingly, my... My granddaughter lives in Israel, and, and uh, she was going to be going through her, her, uh, her bat mitzvah, uh, and she was visiting last summer, and her dad was still in Israel. She came with my daughter and, and, and her, her sister, and, and so he said, would you work with her to prepare for her bat mitzvah? Uh, and so he, the portion, and I was amazed, it was, had Isaiah 52, and it stopped at Isaiah 52, 12. It didn't even get it. It just stopped. So, so you could see the, that in this traditional rabbinic bat mitzvah, they don't even allow you to get into Isaiah fifty three, and and uh, yeah. So anyway, so so the the portion every week in the synagogues you read a portion from the law and a portion from the neviim from the prophets, and when they get to Isaiah fifty two, the next week. They are at Isaiah 54. They jump over it. Um, some scholars... I re, I re, which one was it? I'm trying to remember which one. I think it was uh, Raphael. Uh, it doesn't matter which one was it, but they Jewish scholars point to um, a time many years ago that they decided to stop reading it, which means they used to read it. They used to read Isaiah 53 in the synagogues, and they stopped. They jump over it. Now, it doesn't mean that they, don't, they are not aware of it. Um, but, you know, just like you said with your Baptist friends, the average, my average Jewish friend doesn't sit in the evening at home 
and reads the Old Testament. If you think, do you, do you think King James Version is a little bit difficult to read for most Americans? Yeah, I, I think cer cer certainly Americans under 50 years old, yeah, the King James is a yeah. little bit difficult. Yeah. How, how old is King James Version? King James was from the 1600s. Okay, so 500 years old. How old is the Hebrew Bible, do you know? Uh, the, the Masoretic text? The Masoretic text, I, I'm, I'm guessing it was probably somewhere around 500 AD. Am so, I right? So we, we have actually Masoretic text and we have pre-Masoretic text, which is more or less the same text. Um, but the same Hebrew was kept from back then. Same Hebrew okay. that I read today was what was written back then. Spacing was different and other things and the, 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 the look of the letters was a bit different, but it, it's the same language, you know, same language. Uh, it's also the same language that Moses wrote. So it's not 500 years old, it's like 3000 years old. It's really old, really old. If you give Isaiah or any other prophet to the average Israeli Jew in Israel to read, they're gonna, they, it's, it's not gonna be easy for them. It's gonna be I see. challenging. Now the prophets, the language there is Shakespeare <laughs> in comparison to other places like the Torah, you know? So it's, it's very difficult for the Israeli to read. Many times I play game, a game with um, people who, who wanna know more. Uh, I don't open the Bible, I give them um, for my phone or for my page to read a text. The text happens to be Isaiah 53, but I don't tell them what it is. I let them read it and then I ask them, if you had to guess who wrote it and about what? So they always guess that it's Christians who wrote it about Christ. I've done the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jew Jews read Isaiah 53. If you don't tell them where they're reading from, they think it's, oh, this is from your New Testament. This yeah. is from your Gospels. This is, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's what they think. Let me ask you another question. So, so um, you know, I, I, I read the Bible every day. I've read the Bible every day of my life for 45 years. I start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I read all the way through the Old Testament, the Tanakh all the way through the New Testament to, Isaiah, to Revelation 22. When I finish, I start again. Now, there are so many things that I see in current Judaism that I, I never see in the Bible. So, for example, the wearing of a, a yarmulke or a kuppah uh, on a man's head, the wrapping of a leather strap around their arm the uh, when they pray, a mezuzah outside the door of their house, which they'll kiss as they 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 pass it. Uh, 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 the, the, this thing of 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 lying on the graves of loved ones. I know I don't see this in the Old Testament. Are, is this what you're talking about? Has come in by rabbinic Judaism, and if so, when? When? I don't actually know. Um, I don't think anyone can point to the exact time and place, but I would guess it was during the exile in Babylon. Um, obviously, it was copied from the pagans. Um, again, probably in Babylon. Um, let's take one example. Um, you never see the Hebrew scriptures ever describe somebody putting the tefillin on their hand. Mm -hmm. You just never do. So, 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 so people know what that is. That if you watch a man as he's going to pray, an Orthodox Jew, they will wrap a leather strap around their arm, and correct? Head. Yes. And and the head, a yeah. little box on their head with a yeah. little, little leather strap. Yeah. So, you know, they do that every day. You would assume it would. You, you would assume you would come across that in the Old Testament, um descriptions of people who do that um, but there isn't anything there is a verse that has nothing to do with it that they point to but um, 
my point is that it's a ritual that is actually well known to historians and it's well known in pagan nations and that tells you a lot where we took it from so mm -hmm. a lot of those traditions You've mentioned, uh, how do you call that? G grave sucking, something like that? They lie down on the graves or something? They hug the graves, they kiss the graves, yeah. they pray on the grave. They, it's not just any grave, uh, it's specifically graves of, um, you know how like the Catholics have saints? So in Judaism yes. you have um, like sages, you know, mm -hmm. um, rabbis. But super rabbis, and they go to their graves and they do that. It's not popular in Ashkenazi Judaism. It's very popular in Sephardic Judaism, which again tells you it was taken from the probably from the Arab nations. Um, Ashkenazi Jews reject it. Ashkenazi Jews is European Jews. They reject it. Sephardic Jews, it's Jews who came from. Iraq and Iran and Yemen, well, uh, Morocco. But I, I, I thought Sephardic was from Spain and Misraki was from the Middle East, Persia. So Spain maybe up until the exile, but everyone was deported, exiled from Spain and Portugal many years ago, and they moved to North Africa countries and uh, mm. all of those Arab countries. And um, mm -hmm. when we say Mizrahi, that's what we mean. We, it's the same. Okay. Mizrahi, Safari Jews is the same. Um, that's the, a lot of those pagan... Um, you know how in, in Islam you have... How do you call that in English? It's like a hand that they use everywhere. Um, and, and you have an eye in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Safari Jews, they love it. They have it everywhere. You know, it's I see. the hand of uh, Fatima, I think, but also adopted Ashkenazi Jews. You'll never see it. Never see it. Again, again, it tells you something about those kind of things. Even even lighting the candles on Shabbat, which I think yes. is a be beautiful tradition. OK, but yes. check this out. So the Ethiopian Jews who were exiled from Israel over 2000 years ago just now came back. You know, yes. 10, 20, 30 years ago, just now came back. They were shocked. They said, you guys must be crazy. You cannot light fire on Shabbat. And you do that a few minutes before Shabbat. I mean, why, why on earth would you do that? It was, it was foreign for them, that, the idea. Again, it's, it's traditions that, w I, I don't know, we, we got it from somewhere. I think it's a beautiful tradition. I don't mind lighting a candle before the Shabbat. And, and it's beautiful. It's fine. But when you put tradition above... Um, I, by the way, I think that was the problem Yeshua had with the Pharisees. They put tradition, traditions above the one and most important commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, to love other people, all of a sudden, traditions were more, more important. And I think that caused a, a huge friction back then. Yeah, Jesus spoke of this often. He says, the, you, you know, the words of men, he said, have made the word of God of no effect exactly. because they put their traditions above the scriptures. It's, it's not just that, that they're, they're, they're even parallel. The traditions have gone above the scriptures, and, and you see them often appealing to Jesus. Look, your, your disciples are rubbing the heads of grain on the Sabbath and eating. And, and, he, and he, he says that, you know, he, 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 in fact, it seems as if he went out of his way to, to uh, uh, disdain those, to go against those. I mean, and, uh, uh, and he would, he would uh, give them a whole new light on this. He says, look, David went... And he ate the bread that was the showbread. He ate the bread that was for the priests only. He says the man was hungry, and he gave him that exception. And uh, and and so you see, he says you see, you have, you know, you, you you have people that are that have been suffering in this state for a long time. What's troubling you about my making them well on the Sabbath day? And so that they had all of these traditions, and Jesus 
Jesus seemed to to reject that. Tell tell us about oral law, because my my Orthodox friends keep quoting from an oral law, which which I don't know of it from the Old Testament, but to them it's 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 very very important, and that's what seems to dictate their lives. Well, welcome to the dissertation of my doctorate. Um, so, rabbinic Jews believe that God gave Moses two laws. One of them was the Pentateuch, the written law, and the other one was an oral law. Um, what's your favorite commentary? Oh, I, I read I read the ones from Aerial Ministries, Ar- Arnold Fuchtenbaum's commentaries. They're probably my favorite. Imagine I told you, imagine Arnold told you that these commentaries actually came down from God orally to Moses and, you know, from generation to generation, all the way down to him, until he finally wrote it down. I Then I would not read it. You can still read it, but just don't take it as the word of God. Um, that's, you know, in a nutshell, what they believe about the oral law. So it's, it's a lot of commentaries and traditions and interpretations and, and, and a lot of wisdom as well, a lot of wisdom. Um, which I, I don't believe it, it came down from God. I think it's man-made. Um, a lot of it is, is beautiful and a lot of it is not. And inside of it, um, there are a few stories about Jesus also. Um, and that is the source of what Judaism believes about um, Jesus. Um, the, the, let, let, let me yeah. just mention and correct me if I'm wrong. In, the, in their oral law, in, in their other writings, the things that are written about Jesus are never flattering. They're never very good. Is that the case? That is the case. That is the case. Yeah. So, so you see the source that when you're, when you're talking to Jews, see, th- this is why I was so open to hearing the gospel. I had not been trained against Jesus. When, when, I, when I share with a person from China... I'm sharing with a clean slate, or they came from an atheistic background or a communist background, and it's no problem. When I'm sharing with a Jew, they have specifically been taught against Jesus. In fact, it's easier for me even sharing with with a person from from a Muslim background because they've at least been taught that that Jesus was a great prophet. Uh, But the things that have been written about Jesus are not flattering, and, and uh, you can correct me, but it, 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 it talks about the reason that he had to be, be killed on the Sabbath was because of the st- extent of his divination. I mean, the, 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 the things that they wrote about him were not flattering. There's not a lot written about him, but what's written <clears throat> is not flattering. I'll give you one example. There is a, a sage, a rabbi, his name is uh, Unculus, Unculus, and in the Talmud, there is a story about Unculus communicating uh, with Jesus from the dead, from the dead, from the dead, yeah, um, which is an issue on its own, but leave that aside for a second. When he was communicating, of course, I don't believe it. That's what the Talmud says. Mm-hmm. And when Unculus was communicating with Jesus, from the dead, Jesus told them that he is being punished by God um, to be um, boiled in human and animal um, feces forever and ever because he was a false prophet and a false messiah. That's one example. Mm. However, you have to give I have to give some credit to the Jewish people, and let me explain. We've been... I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in the shoes of the Jews. We've been persecuted by Christians 
in the name of Christ so strongly from the very beginning that the source of all of our troubles for the last 2,000 years always had to do, you know, like crusades, pogroms, inquisition, blood labels, holocaust. Um, have you ever read Martin Luther's um, booklet on the Jews and their lies? It's disgusting. It, yeah, to say the least. So I can see why they would respond the way they would. And it, it doesn't make it right or anything like that. But I'm just saying the anti-Semitism is so ingrained in Christianity. Only mm -hmm. in the last 40, 50 years, things are starting to change, especially in evangelical Christianity, also in the Catholic Church, um, starting to change. But up, up until 50 years ago or so, Christianity equaled anti-Semitism, if we like to admit it or not. I, I thank you for pointing that out. That is, that is so important to point out there. Uh, that, that when you look at the source of your persecution, and it was associated for good or for bad, or, well, for bad, with, always with Christianity. Mm -hmm. not, not always with, I mean, there was certainly Islamic persecution and things, but, but so often with Christianity, uh, uh, you can begin to understand some of their wariness about this. I thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, you, you know, in the holo my, my um, grandparents are Holocaust survivors. My grandmother was um, held captive in a, in a Nazi uh, camp, in a concentration camp. And she was tortured. You know, one of the things the Nazi sh soldiers did to her was to tie her up and to, to take the nails out of her fingers and tell her that that's because she rejected Christ. And then when Christmas time came, the Jews in those concentration camps, they would hear the, the Nazi soldiers um, walking and singing um, Christmas carols on the way to their churches and they would hear the the church bells and that wasn't like that th that was um Germany back then was a Protestant Protestant mm -hmm. country mm -hmm. you know Hitler quoted so many times Martin Luther so many times not only Hitler but a lot of his um, second in commands also quoted a lot of the church fathers and, and, and Martin Luther, people don't realize how anti-Semitic the church was up until just a couple of um, decades ago, really. I, I, I go into details a lot about that in, in my new book, but I, when I did that research, I, I was blown away myself. Which, which new book are you talking about? What's the name of it? Why Don't Jews Believe in Jesus? Why Don't Jews Believe in Jesus, right. That's a 2023. It's actually coming out this week. Coming out this week. Okay, that, that's probably a good one. You know, I've, I've read the writings of Martin Luther, and other people have pointed this, this out, that it was the writings of Martin Luther that set the, the Nazis on their crusade against the Jewish people. And, and that's how bad it got. And Martin Luther, really, it was a shift in his life toward his old age that he started writing this way. Isn't that correct? That It wasn't throughout his life that he was doing this, but it, it happened near the end of his life he started writing this way. Yeah, you know, in the beginning, Martin Luther actually spoke in favor of the Jews. He said that... Of course, the Jews would reject the gospel because it was a Catholic gospel. So they, they saw the Catholic Church and they rejected it, of course. And now I will introduce the gospel to them. And then they saw, th then he saw that they, the Jews reject his gospel as well. And then something happened there and the rest is history. But yes. 
he never understood that the gospel, you know, you know it's, it's amazing for me that on the one hand, Martin Luther picked up on this amazing truth that if God is really our father, we don't have to earn his affection and love. He loves us because he is love. You know, you don't earn your salvation. You don't walk to, to earn your salvation, which is, by the way, it was new for Luther and Christianity. It, it was not a new idea in Judaism, not at all. But on the other hand, the version, you know, you know the models of atonement? Have you ever looked into those, the models of atonement? M models of atonement, I don't know. Okay, so if you ask a Christian, did Jesus die for you? It's going to say, yes, of course he died for me. If you ask them, what does that mean? What does that mean that he died for you? What happened on the cross that served that atonement, that forgiveness? What happened there? So the answer you're going to get depends on, first of all, where you are in the world, what denomination, and also what time in history you're going to set your time machine to. Um, for example, we are talking about the Protestant world. The Protestant world believes, um, back then, in the time of Luther, it believed in a theory called the satisfaction theory of atonement. And then Luther and Calvin, during their time, it came out, uh, they came up with um, penal substitution atonement. And that's the gospel they brought to the Jews, which makes no sense to Jews, no sense to Jews. And they rejected it, of course. I understand why they would reject those models of atonement. Um, my own experience evangelizing Jewish people, they connect with the first model of atonement that um, Christianity offered much better. Um, the first one was called Ransom Theory. Ransom Theory was the theory that more or less everybody in Christianity believed in the first 1,000 years. Um, there is a tweak on it um, that um, came out about 100 years ago um, or less. It's called Christus Victor, but it's the same. It's a Ransom Theory. Um, it's just a different view. Uh, of course, you are familiar with C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. Have you read or watched um, Narnia, um, you know, with the lion and the kid Edmond? Do you remember the story? Uh, I, I've, seen, I've seen parts of the movie. My, my, my daughter went through this. I mean, she forced everybody to watch this stuff. I mean, she was really into it. I like her uh, already. So... Yeah. In that book, what C.S. Lewis did was um, to offer a very simple explanation of the ransom theory of atonement, which he believed in, okay? Um, basically, what ransom theory of atonement means is that, I'll, I'll use C.S. Lewis's illustration, Edmund, the, the naughty kid um, went after the, um, the witch. The witch represents Satan. The kid represents you and me. And he followed the witch because, you know, she offered him some things and he was on a fight with his um, siblings and siblings. And anyways, he went after her and sinned. Now, according to the law of Narnia, he needed to, uh, he belonged to, to, to the witch and he needed to die. So the lion came, the lion obviously represents Jesus, and he said, you know what, just take my life instead. Spare Edmond, I love Edmond, spare Edmond, take my life instead. And 
he gave his life in, instead. And that's the view that C.S. Lewis and also Ransom Theory um, of, of the cross, of what happened on the cross when Jesus died. Okay, And then came Calvin and Luther, and they said, no, 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 no. That's not the gospel. They said, God wants to punish us because um, we are not perfect. Never mind he created us um, finite. We are not perfect. He created us limited. But because we are not perfect, he wants to destroy us and punish us and kill us and abuse us and torture us. So instead of doing that to us, he took Jesus and he abused him and tortured him and, and all of that stuff. Not all Calvinists would believe that, but some Calvinists would believe that. Um, it's a very popular view in a lot of um, Protestant movements. Um, but it's something that Jews cannot and will not relate to because they don't see God that way. They, we see God, again, I'm putting my feet in the shoes of the Jew. We see God as Abba. Abba is a father, but it's not just father, it's, it's like daddy, you know? Um, it's very relational. It's not, it's not about a legal contract. Oh, I have to kill you, but I will kill Jesus instead. It's a different mindset, you know? If you, if your kids, are they perfect? No, not, not generally. <laughs> of course not. Because they are not perfect, do you want to kill them? Never. I would die a hundred times for them. Okay, so why is that the gospel we preach to Jews? That because they didn't keep the law, God, wants to, God must kill them because that's the righteous thing to do because they are not perfect. And they hear that and it tickles their ear the wrong way and they reject yeah. it. So it, it's a lot more complicated than just prophecies or persecution. It also has to do with the gospel we bring to Jews. You know, what I find really helps <clears throat> when I'm sharing with a Jew is to say, look, I'm a Jew and I have no intent of making you stop being a Jew. I want you to be a better Jew. Hmm. And I'll tell you what helped me to be a much better Jew. And I explained it in that context that you were born a Jew, you're going to die a Jew. And I'm not here to change you. I just want to tell you about the Messiah. Beautiful. And th that changes the whole conversation with Jews when I share with them. That I'm not here to convert you for anything. It's, it's in fact, it's Gentiles that had to convert from worshiping idols to worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Jew just has to make teshuva, to return to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is what the Jew does. The Jew is to return to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is the way I explain it to them. I'm just calling you to return, to return to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It changes everything. I think it's perfect and beautiful, and that's the way it should be. And probably it's because you follow Arnold Fuchtenbaum. <laughs> um, but you know... Yeah, I've, lear I've learned a lot from Arnold. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. You know... I, in fact, I served on his board. I was, I, was, I, was the, I was the chairman of the board for a while of his ministry. Very cool. You know how in Christianity you have this huge debate, um, faith versus works? Yes. Of course. Okay. In Judaism, that doesn't even exist. I mean, I mean, look at the Pentateuch. Look at the first five books of, of the Old Testament, which is the Holy of Holies for the Jews. How many times does it speak there? And, and you have a lot of laws and rules and do that and don't do that. How many times there does it speak about hell? Never. Uh, never, never, never. Never, never. Because it was obvious, always obvious for the Jewish people that my salvation is because I have faith in the God of Israel. Okay, even the Talmud, the rabbis of the Talmud, they say, even if you're a Jew who is in prison, 
you have a place in the next world you're saved right. because you believe in the God of Israel. It's, yeah, there's an a angel who's just going to snatch you in case you're going the wrong direction. There'll be an angel to just take you and snatch you back. The, the, regardless of what they mean by it, my, my point yeah, yeah. is that they acknowledge that salvation is by faith alone, have nothing to do with works. So all that argument in Christianity, faith and works, it just, it's not relevant for the Jews. You know, it was wait, always... Wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. In, in, wait, 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 in, let, in, let in, me finish. However, okay. however, we need to tell them that they also have to accept the manifestation or whatever you want to call it of, of God in, in the embodiment of Jesus. It's no, part but, of the deal. But let me let me read you this portion because I, you know I'm 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 not understanding what you, what you're saying here because I, you know what what I know of Judaism is 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 so much of 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 this is is around works. I mean, I have to light this candle, I have to say this prayer, I have to do this, do this, and this is why Paul writes. He says. This is in Romans chapter 9, uh, uh, verse 30. What shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith? But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. So it was the Jew who was, who was caught up in this works thing, thinking that that was going to get them righteous. So, so explain what you mean in this context then. So in their mind, the Jews, to be righteous and to be saved is, one, is not one and the same. Okay, I, I just told you, like in the Talmud, you have... This, the great sage that explains that you can even be in jail because you messed up dramatically, but you're saved. You're not very righteous. Okay. It's as if your children are trying to compete one with, between one another. Who is the most righteous one by the way they act and behave? Okay, to impress you. To, to, to get your favor on them, to get gifts from you. They, it has nothing to do with um, how they think they get saved. They think they get saved because they are Jews. Remember what they told Jesus, our father is Abraham, you know, the, in their yeah, mentality. Abraham is our father. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Abraham is our father, you know, we, we, we are fine, we are saved. Mm. But we... We earn God's favor by how by what we do, you know. Yes. I think it has a lot to do with the um, if you if you consider the parable of the um, prodigal son, mm -hmm. you know, the older brother. Yes. He was in the house. His father loved him. No doubt right. about it. No question about it. He was part right. of the family. But he completely did not understand his father's heart. He was trying to be legalistic, and by keeping all the laws, he thought he will impress his father. And that's Judaism. They think they are impressing God by, by the different laws and stuff like that. By the way, I, 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 debate with, I debated with a rabbi, you know. Um, rabbis would even tell me, because you are a Jew, you are saved. But you're going to lose your um, rewards in the next world because I'm a bad Jew, because I believe in Jesus. But because I'm a Jew, I will be saved. That's the idea. You know, they're yes. trying to earn God's favor and rewards in the next world and blessings in this world. And they don't understand yes. that you're a child of God. He's your father. He loves you. He's going to give you gifts anyways. Um, but they are obviously also missing that salvation comes from faith, yes, in God, but also in the Son of God. If you reject the Son of God, you, re you reject the Father. You cannot yes. say, I believe yes. in the Father. 
Right. So, so what, what Paul was saying in the book of Galatians is there's a covenant with Abraham. That Abrahamic covenant is for the nation, for the nation, uh, of, for this nation that is descended from Abraham. And that will never go away. The Abrahamic covenant was a permanent covenant. God was the one who, who, who authenticated that. God was the one who verified that. Abraham was asleep at the time when, mm-hmm. when, when God moved through these things. Uh, uh, the Mosaic Covenant, that was, that was ratified on both ends, and, and uh, uh, that was for a time. That was going to fade away. But that Abrahamic Covenant is for the nation of Israel. The individual has to still have the relationship with Messiah in order to be saved. Uh, uh, there's a relationship with the nation that is not going to go away, but the individual, it's still through relationship with this Messiah. This is what this is this message in in, in, in the book of Galatians. I'm with you. Yeah, I'm 100% yeah. with you. Through yeah. faith in Messiah and obviously God. Um, yes. You know, many, many times also another problem with evangelizing the Jews, I heard it so many times when Christians come with the Ten Commandments, and they ask the Jew, oh, have you ever lied? Oh, see, because you lied, then God have to punish you in the lake of fire forever and ever, and they point to the Ten Commandments, but they don't understand that the Mosaic Covenant had nothing to do with an individual's salvation. It was like a constitution. You know, if the constitution says, you shall not steal, and I steal, and the police officer comes and takes me and puts me in jail, that has nothing to do with my individual salvation um, or faith or anything like that. I will pay for my sins. You know, God created a system in the world that is going to make sure, one way or another, um, you know, I'm, 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 you, if you hide the taxes, they're going to catch you and put you in jail. But that has nothing to, that's a constitution thing. And, and you're not going to look at it thinking, if I don't pay my taxes, I'm going to lose my salvation. You will think, if I'm not going to pay my taxes, I'm going to sit in jail. <laughs> and it's wrong as a Christian anyways. But, and maybe it's going to hurt your rewards in the following world and the blessings in this world, whatever. But it has nothing to do with salvation. And when we come to Jews and we tell them, oh, you broke a commandment from the 613, so you lost your salvation. You, 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 they don't relate to those explanations, you know, the, the, the gospel presentations. They don't relate to it. They don't understand it. They think differently. They don't see the Mosaic covenant, the Sinai covenant, in relation with salvation, it just makes no sense to them. It's a national, like you said, a national thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been this has been wonderful. I want you to tell us a little bit about your new books coming out because I I'm counting them: one, two, three, four, f- five. You you, you have uh, six books coming out in 2023. Six is what yeah. I counted from your website. Yeah, well, a lot of them are small. Two of them are photography books, so you can't really count those. And but there's, there's, there's a lot of work in that. I mean, you, you've been a busy guy. That's, for a year, that's what I've been doing. Um, well, two, two of the books, The Gospel of Divine Abuse, I've been working on that. Um, it, it actually started as a project with a, with a professor, someone who was my professor in Dallas Theological Seminary um, back in 20. 17 or something like that we came out with a small version and then i kept developing on my own and then and the gospel of divine abuse came out and so i've been working on it for a very long time the why don't jews believe in jesus you know how that came about i actually gave a lecture in texas three or four years ago and i had a couple of friends who wanted to come to the conference that I spoke at, but at the last moment something happened, they couldn't make it. So I asked the, um, the people who organized the conference, I asked them to please give me uh, on a USB stick the video of my lecture. And the lecture was, was, why don't Jews believe in Jesus? 
and I, I put it on YouTube and I send them a link and a year later it had 5 million views my lecture and then I realized okay I think people are interested to know <laughs> why don't Jews believe in Jesus so I started to develop it in my mind and, and you know for my experience and, and a lot of research I'm telling you the anti-semitism part wow. killed me um, and I came out with that book. So it's, it's not a quick book. It, um, it took time. And it, it, it's not a very long book. It's 200 pages. Basically, I unfold three reasons. Um, I call the first reason, reason number one, the lies we tell ourselves. Um, and that's how Jesus became, Yeshua became the best kept secret in Judaism. We talked a little bit about it. Reason number two is what was done to us in Jesus' name, which is both Christian anti-Semitism all the way back to the Church Fathers and also replacement theology. Mm -hmm. And then reason number three is what Christians sometimes tell us about our God. And that is, we also touched on it a little bit. Um, and it's why Jews continue to reject the gospel because it doesn't make sense to them, but it's a specific presentation of the gospel um, that tickles their ear the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of the main three reasons. So at least this book, Why Don't Jews Believe in Jesus? I know that refuting rabbinic obje objections is also on audiobooks. Uh, uh, will will these, these get on audiobooks as well? I don't know, maybe. You know, it, it's a kind of a funny story how the book you just had in your hand came about. It was, um, we had, um, again, it, it, during my um, doctorate with Dallas Theological, one of the classes, they, they wanted to work with us about how, how do we publish something. So they said, you know, go find something that you wrote or something, compile it and, and publish it as a book, self-publish it as a book. So that's what I did. I took like 50 of the short videos I did in Hebrew, translated them to English, the evangelistic apologet Jewish apologetics, put it, compiled it into a book and self-published it. Now, if you look now on Amazon, it has over 2000 reviews, averaging like almost five. And I, I did not expect that, you know, so you, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You never yeah. know. No, I, I, I got it. I, I see that with, with videos that I make. Sometimes I spend 10 minutes making a video and it had tons more views than videos that I spend hundreds of hours planning for. So yeah, you, you never really know. No. But um, you're doing a great work and I appreciate what you're doing. I know that, that you, you've certainly undergone a lot of attack because you... you are preaching the gospel and you're in Israel where it's not easy to preach the gospel. You know, I, I don't think people know that that uh, it, it borders on going to prison. I mean, it came very close to a vote about being, you'd go to prison if you ever evangelized to a Jew. And I think it was just... Uh, 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 Prime Minister Netanyahu said, "No, we're 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 not, we're not gonna we're not gonna accept that." But there's a it's it's not easy to evangelize in Israel. I'm not sure. I may be your only friend left. Could be, could be. <laughs> but I'm not any better than anybody else. I need God's grace and a lot of it. And at the end of the day, it's it's not about me. And God is good, and Yeshua is good, and. Um, I praise him and I put my faith in him and I have no idea what's the next step is going to look like for me um, no idea but um, I trust that God is good and he loves me amen amen and you know I just want to tell you when you you were the first person to write to me after that debate that I did and I wasn't proud of my performance uh, uh, I, I didn't didn't totally expect to be to be uh Israeli. Uh, have it. Yeah, yeah. And then you wrote to me, you said, oh, that was perfect. That's, you're, 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 you're Israeli. You, you know, you're shouting, this is actually what young people want. This is the way you have to do it. I can, I can tell you, you're, you're not, I, I mean, uh, uh, not everybody agrees with your assessment, but I was so glad that at least the Israeli community 
understands the passion, so I appreciate that. And I think the younger generation in the United States um, becoming more Israeli, they, I think they're fed up with all the, um, they, they just want something direct, authentic. They want an authentic experience also in the church, but also in debates and, you know, and, and I think it's okay that you expressed your emotions. He expressed his emotions. You both did. I, I found it. I found it lovely, but again, I'm an Israeli, so the Middle You're East. You're an Israeli. Oh. I mean, there's so many people that told me that they couldn't even get through it. They just couldn't watch it anymore. After, after 30 minutes, they had to turn it off, and then you told me you loved it. So anyway, I just wanted you to know what encouragement that was to, to hear that from you. I, I told Shireen, I said, hey, there's this one Israeli apologist, and he said it was great. So, oh, so um, I focused in on, on, on that. Thank yeah. you for that. Pleasure. Pleasure. I enjoyed it. Good. Good. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, God bless you and God bless your work. And may God use these, these books to really see many come to the Lord, just like that one friend of yours that was reading your book. And, and uh, that's what caused him to open up his heart to Yeshua. And, and uh, you referred him to me. And, and uh, that's how I got to meet him. Yeah. Uh, and thank, yeah. You. thank you for embracing him. Oh, we were glad to do it. Glad to do it. And uh, uh, it, it was nice to have a fellow Jew come to lunch. Uh, uh, there's, not, there's not many of us at the lunches. Yeah, Israeli Jew, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was so quite it was... amazing. 20 years I haven't spoken to him, and all of a sudden he writes to me because he, he, wrote, he read the book. You know, uh -huh. it's encouraging. So, again, thank you for embracing him. Yeah. He really enjoyed it. He really appreciated it. Yeah, and then it was because he showed me the book that he was reading, I thought, okay, I have to read that. If, that, if that's what opened your heart, then that's, that's why I picked this up and read it and, and contacted you again. All right, well, God bless you, my friend. The Lord be with you. And let me just mention this to an, anybody who's watching, that if you want to hear a message of the gospel, if you, if you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, send me an email tour at drjamestour.org. And this is not to believers. This is to unbelievers who do not believe in the physical resurrection. And, and we'll get together by Zoom for an hour. And uh, um, uh, let me tell you why I embrace this. And uh, uh, give me that opportunity. If you're enjoying this series, give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button. And that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos. There are no salaried employees in this organization. All the accounting, all the legal work, that's all done by friends of mine. The only thing that I have to pay for is the production work. And if you could help us out with that, I'd appreciate it. There's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways. Thank you.